Okay, yeah, let's let's start. Uh, I guess we can just start with a simple introduction. If you can tell us a bit more about yourself and uh, what you do. Uh, my name is Alexander. I'm in my early thirties. Currently, uh, I am a, a fellow at uh, uh, Wake. Wake Forest University, uh, specializing in cardiology, and a licensed physician practicing internal medicine. So my prior path uh, is kind of complicated. I did my medical school in Russia, did my cardiology training in Russia, then moved to the United States, did a year of clinical trials at Harvard Medical School, and then joined New uh, Brooklyn Methodist Hospital. Uh, it was New York Methodist Hospital at that time as a cardiac imaging fellow, basically specializing in cardiac MRI and cardiac CT. Did a year at Harvard Medical School uh, in clinical trials and uh, spe specializing in clinical trials. So it was a dedicated one year training program and then joined uh, as a imaging fellow at New York Methodist Hospital. I was specializing in cardiac MRI and cardiac CT. Um, basically, then I realized that I want to do it to complete my cardiology training, repeat my cardiology training here in America. So I got into residency, finished residency in 2020 and uh, embarked on uh, starting my fellowship. So I'm a fellow of, and fully licensed internal medicine physician, board certified, uh, board certified, obviously board certified physician. Yeah, I guess that would be the right way to say. And uh, currently practicing mostly like uh, have calls four or five times uh, a month, but most of my time dedicated right now to my uh, fellowship training, which is a four year program. And basically the encompasses uh, a master degree in translational sciences and three years of uh, cardi cardiology, cardiovascular medicine training. So this year is predominantly uh, research and getting master's degree, and I'm currently working, actually finishing up a paper looking at over 6,000 patients' uh, case series who were sent a monthly antibody test, and basically we're seeing, if there is, we're looking for any association between prior history of cardiovascular disease, medications you use, or any of the blood work, and your risk of getting a COVID. So oh. that's, ba that's, that's, that's basically... Uh, what uh, uh, I'm doing currently right now, I'm hopeful that uh, I'll be done with all this stuff by Monday. So it's uh, been already uh, three months of my life dedicated <laughs> to this, but uh, I'm very, very uh, blessed to work with people, uh, particularly my mentor, Dr. Harrington, who started this back in April. And uh, it's it's a it's a phenomenal project. Not because it's just happening in the Wake Forest, but because it will include six or seven other sites across America. So it's Tulane, George Washington, University of Maryland, University of Mississippi, uh, Atrium Health, and something else that I cannot recall. But essentially, it'll be over a hundred thousand patients who will be participating in having this monthly uh, antibody test to detect the cumulative incidence of uh, seroconversion. So I thought it's very, very interesting. And uh, early in March, when I was a resident, uh, I got COVID myself, like March 16. I tested positive. Uh, I was extremely lucky. My course of disease was pretty mild. And uh, within seven days, I fully recovered. Those seven days were not fun at all. Uh, it's like the worst back pain of your life. It's like, if you can imagine having a kidney stone, but it's wow. just keeps on going and going and going. And like well, overall, several sleepless nights, but hey, compared to what people went through, it's a blessing. And uh, working in a busy hospital in New York, unfortunately, uh, I can definitely say that uh, things that happened in New York in well, March, April, early May, it, it's it's a disaster and it's horrible. It's, it's I, I wish I've never seen anything like that. Well, 
you know, there are a couple of questions that I think interests me uh, from 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 what you've said. Um, let's figure out the COVID. No, a lot a, a lot of myths are going on right now. When you get COVID, what really happens? to you, to your body? Like, is it some sort of disease of your immune system or is it just some kind of virus that affects only your lungs or your... Uh, I'll try to break it down in a simple digestible forms, uh, saying in a very plain uh, language, we don't exactly know, but we know a lot. So, uh, first thing, when a person gets exposed to the virus, uh -huh. The virus load, the mind of, amount of virus particles that you get exposed and that get into your body, this is the very important factor that was uh, overlooked until recently, and it, it plays a huge role how ill will person be. So the more virus you get, the uh -huh. sicker the person will get. So once you get the virus, it takes approximately from 2 to 14 days at the median of 5 days. So, meaning uh, 5 days is a time that's needed for virus to incubate. And approximately... Uh -huh. Go Quick ahead. Quick question. Is there, like, any other viruses that are working similar way? Like, because, let's say, if you get regular cold or something, it's right away, basically. But for some yeah. reason, this particular virus, you know, your body... For the first few days, try not to realize it. Uh, so it's what's called in, like in, in, incubation period. So okay. every virus, every disease has some sort of incubation period. And basically, for flu, it's two for four days, right? It's uh, uh, basically uh, the m many experiments where it's shown that when, no matter what uh, virus or bacteria you're introducing, there is always some delay period and uh, this delay period is a function of uh, someone's condition so how mm -hmm. sick someone is so how elderly someone is and it's a function of a viral of uh, infectious dose so for example if you get a blood transfusion uh with a uh, i don't know bacteria in it never happens but let's say that that's what happens you'll get sick immediately right away because it will be an enormous dose of uh, uh, infection. On the other hand, if you uh, cut yourself and uh, uh, basically bacteria get inside right away, it will take time for it to develop into fully formed abscess and or anything of that nature. So it's it's just a, it's, it's a function and same happens with any viral virus. And uh, uh, as you say, flu is one example other coronaviruses that are commonly commonly circulating, they tend to have about uh, three to seven days incubation period as well from what I've been reading. Again, that's uh, that is just uh, uh, how biology for most of the viruses work. Okay. Okay. So uh, once uh, uh, incubation period is over, a person will start developing symptoms. So uh, in the incubation period, what's happening is the virus is rapidly multiplying using uh, host cells as factories. So virus cannot multiply itself. It's essentially dead outside of the yep. uh, human cells. It needs our cells to use as a machinery to create billion, billion of copies for itself. While it's doing this, our immune system is trying to recognize it and to fight it and mount an appropriate response. So it's a kind of uh, uh, weaponary race. Whoever gets quicker and uh, who is the first one, uh, basically, to uh, bring down its opponent. And uh, meanwhile, uh, the virus starts affecting undoubtedly uh, lung tissue, so it's so-called fibrosis, which is just a function of inflammation. And most of the time it's lower part of the lungs, but again, depending on the, on the extent of the virus viral presence, it may infect the entire lung parenchyma. And then what we recently learned, uh, I mean, we learned it pretty early, 
it's suppressing the immune system. So there is a depletion of white blood cells and in particular lymphocytes. So the virus has this effect on the bone marrow production, which is not uncommon. For example, HIV, advanced HIV has this very similar thing. Uh, and what's very interesting about this particular virus, it has multiple effects on other parts of the body. So you probably heard about uh, clot formation, and that's actually a function of virus affecting endothelium. So it's basically the inner lining of the blood vessels. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it attacks it, affects it, and causing it causes inflammation over there, uh, promoting uh, thrombogenesis at those areas. And microthrombosis is actually a particularly interesting feature of this virus. Since I'm a cardiologist, I'm very interested in the effect of the coronavirus on the heart. Uh -huh. And there are multiple uh, data showing that, yes, it does affect the heart. There is a swelling that we can detect. But it does not directly affect the cardiomyocytes, so the cells of the heart. It affects them indirectly via, via uh, interrupting the blood flow and limiting the blood flow. But again, it is so. We have microditis, right? Inflammation of the heart muscle because of any other virus. It's like it happens, it's known. And there is like lymphocytic, so white blood cells and lymphocytes as a subtype infiltrating it, attacking it, basically damaging the heart. Mm -hmm. It's not what's happening here. Uh, there are, and it's, 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 we can talk hours just about that, but we're not, we're not. But basically, it's, uh, and we can say the same, similar things about uh, other organs. So, for example, we know for sure that for some reason it can attack pancreas, right? Uh, it's the inner gland that is secreting insulin and glucagon, the hormones that are paramount and other digestive enzymes that are paramount for digestion and paramount for your uh, sugar uh, balance. And uh, I've personally seen at least four people who developed uh, type 1 diabetes as a complication of uh, uh, COVID, and, and it just and it's just devastating. Someone who's in like, I mean, uh, to tell you the truth, I had a colleague of mine, emergency room doctor, who got a pretty severe disease uh, sometime in March, in April, and in end of May he came to the hospital with a complication of type one diabetes, diabetes, uh, diabetic ketoacidosis. Basically, it's a condition when your body doesn't produce enough insulin, and your metabolism switched from producing from digesting sugars to digesting fats and you can kind of uh, accumulate ketones and it's uh, a deadly condition wow. if not treated properly and it affects uh brain undoubtedly uh to the extent that we need a lot more data but at this point in time no one can deny that there is effect on uh some people's perception cognition and it definitely deserves well more evaluation Interestingly enough, um, and there was a, some articles earlier, I didn't see anything lately, is that uh, uh, man's uh, fertility system, in particular, uh, basically cells that are producing sperm, they have so-called privileged immunity. So they're actually uh, covered, they are protected from antibodies and everything, everything circulating in the blood. And there is some uh, speculation that virus can uh, persist in those cells for quite some time, even after uh, infection is resolved, just given the fact that it, it, uh, those cells have privileged immunity. So the long-term implications are definitely not known, but it's, uh, it's yeah, it's, uh, one of the things that will definitely will be evaluated further. And again, uh, as I said, unfortunately, it's not just lungs. It's definitely also vasculature. It's definitely other organs. I mean, for sure, pancreas. Um, they, there is data for liver, for sure. Uh, there is, as we said, cognition and uh, brain. There are a lot of basically facts that, that we know now. And uh, a lot we 
don't know, but um, can we can we talk uh, like fr from what you've said? I understand that like different people develop different conditions based on their uh, on, on, on how much virus they got. Is it like a main factor, or or like let's say, can someone if I get more virus but I have a better immune system? Uh, then I would respond better than someone who gets the same amount of virus and have a bit, uh, you know, what, worse their health and bad habits. Like, I want to know what, what precautions can we do in order, you know, to, 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 to be in a lower risk group. Okay. So, answer to your question maybe a little bit more complicated. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot control the amount of virus that uh, someone gets, right? If that was the case, let's say we all get minimal amount and just get a mild disease and basically that's, that's what's called vaccination. But it's not, uh, it's like in the vaccination you get a small amount of virus or, or like in, inactivated virus and you move on, right? But the problem is in, in real life, it's not controlled environment and you cannot control this amount. What you can do is just wear a mask, uh, make sure that people surrounding you wear a mask. Because the most important thing that mask does, it reduces the amount of virus that a person is uh, uh, transmitting outside. The person is breathing out and if you have a mask, it, the number of viral particles getting out just reduced uh, by several folds mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that uh and if you have a mask and if it's a hospital grade like n95 mask that is pretty good protection for, for a person that uh, basically limits uh the risk of severe diseases uh you're absolutely right that uh, human body is a extremely complicated system and no single factor can account for all the variability we can keep on going mentioning facts uh, factors such as age someone's b uh, body mass index uh, someone's pre-existing conditions the acuity and how controlled are those pre-existing conditions whether a person is vitamin d deficient whether a person has a, a low zinc level in the blood all those factors were shown to be independently associated with how sick one would be if he or she gets the virus so it's a it's a it's a whole kind of i think um, part of science that yet to be explored and to put it in a comprehensive model we don't have it yet i can tell you for sure that uh, my particular project is focusing to tell you if there is a difference in your chances to get a disease based on those pre-existing conditions. Uh -huh. And what and what we're finding so far is that no matter what conditions you have, no matter uh, your blood work values, or anything of that nature, those things, they, they just don't matter. If for you, they don't affect your chance, your odds of getting a disease, but once you get a disease, they play a tremendous role between those if you're going to have a smile disease, going to just feel under the weather for a day or two, will not feel it at all, or someone who ended up going to the hospital and require like a uh, intensive care unit uh, and uh, invasive ventilation. And uh, in your studies, is there any like certain factor that you see that uh, affects this condition the most? So, as I said, we're looking at uh, odds of cumulative incidence. So, basically, how any factor would explain variability in seroconversion. And the only thing, again, uh, it's a couple of things to acknowledge. So, out of those 6,000 patients, only around 10% uh, developed antibodies uh, during this study. Most of them had minimal to no symptoms and most of them didn't have a durable immune response and uh, what we found so far that none of the factors that we analyzed that i personally analyzed from the uh, previous the weight race ethnicity uh, sex 
of their smoking habits, none of those things matter and none of them affect the odds of them getting an infection. So basically it's uh, like a, if you call a left virus, it affects everyone, it doesn't care. Every, oh. everyone's, a, everyone's a equal, but once it affects you, that's uh, uh, your, those primaries are definitely crucial to uh, predict how sick or uh, how aggressive you need to be in terms of treating the patient. I'll give you an example. You probably heard that recently FDA issued an emergency use authorization for, let me try to say the right, banlavimumab. Basically, it's a monoclonal antibodies developed by Eli Lilly, followed by monoclonal antibodies developed by Regeneron to treat people uh, who are at high risk of developing severe COVID. And you probably heard that President Trump and right now his lawyer, Rudolph Giuliani, and uh, uh, governor of, of New Jersey, well, all of them being white, elderly, above 70, obese, not so healthy males, uh -huh. did really, really good. And actually in the study, it's shown that uh, following the infusion, the risk of hospital admission uh, with this monoclonal antibodies went down from like over 15%, which is a high, of course, it's, it's a high risk, to approximately one or less than 1%. So it's definitely something that I would love a lot of people to get, but due to limited supply chain and limited availability, unfortunately, sure. it's... Uh, uh, becoming a very unethical issue where uh, rich and powerful are getting it, where people with uh, limited access to healthcare or people just coming to regular emergency room won't be getting it. And I mean, uh, to make it even absurd, more absurd, in, in uh, Colorado, they have a lottery that happens every day for those who will get it. That's absurd. <laughs> This is this is interesting, yeah. Wow, yeah. I, I'm located in Canada. I believe we have a bit uh, more. Uh, yeah, that, that's. Uh, I mean, I mean, like here in our system is, uh, we have a huge problem with lineups because you yeah. know, but then we everyone would. Yeah, we do it equally, and and that, I think that's the whole premise of medicine that. Uh, no matter who you are, where you're coming from, you should be be sure that you're going to get the best medical care available, right? And yeah. uh, unfortunately, here, it's your social status uh, basically determining. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's essentially life-saving treatment, right? Because if you think about it, uh, those uh, going decreasing the number of people needing hospital admission from 16 to 1, is basically making sure that this elderly person who is at high risk of infection will recover in two days, like Donald Trump, or like some elderly people who are not so lucky and don't get it, uh, end up on the ventilator and dying like a month later. So it's it's uh, it's uh, it's not uh, well publicized, and it's uh -huh. uh, there are some journalists trying to to kind of shed more light on this issue, but it's definitely a very sad reality. Wow. So basically the main problem, in, I mean, I understand like March situation, for example, in New York and in the United States, why it happened, I guess, because no one was really prepared. Is it what happens? But then later on right now, it's big uh, inequality issue. Is it what the situation is? It's hard, hard to say. I mean, me medication is pretty expensive. It's about uh, two to $4,000, depending. I'm not sure about the pricing. Okay, let's say it's five, like approximately, I'm not sure. $5,000. Uh, since it was just recently approved, uh, I'm not sure what is reimbursement of by uh, the private insurers. I'm pretty sure that Medicaid, Medicare don't have rules as of yet how to approve it. Hospitals uh, getting limited supplies from uh, those companies because unfortunately at this time they cannot scale up the production. Uh -huh. And then you need a special units to infuse those medications, right? So you 
So basically, you know, okay, this is a person with a confirmed COVID. This is a person who's at high risk of developing severe infection. So you need to set up a logistical separate building or space where people would be coming to get an infusion. And all the staff should be trained to do that. There should be all the precautions. And it's, it's becoming a logistical challenge. And just infu infusion part, and we taking out of equation logistics of delivering and logistics of uh, scaling up the production. So limited supply, uh, logistical challenges, just creating this uh, unequal access to uh, those medications. I see. And uh, right now we have a really interesting situation, I, I, I think, in, in, in media, because like there are for some reason two groups of people, you know, that some people believe in COVID, some people don't believe in COVID. Me, myself, I'm personally from a medical family, so my, my, my grandmother was a cardiac nurse, and then uh, my mother is a pharmacist, so for me it's like pretty, pretty clear how everything works. Mm -hmm. But why do you think it's, it's happening? Uh, I think it's, uh, again, it's hard for me to grasp the whole magnitude of the problem, but one of the piece that I think is uh, well, yeah, what, what do you see from, from, from your perspective as a doctor being in a hospital? Why do you think there is so big? You know, I think it's just polarization, polarization in, in, in the society. It's the people who do have things, own things, have education, and people that, that don't. And there's do's and don'ts uh, in many ways. Uh, justify people's perception of information and uh, it just emphasizes to me that the current media model is not sustainable where you're just preaching to your own audience and basically people with different views are completely out of your reach, right? We're just put, uh, pu putting aside all the political uh, debates, right? Just we'll look at the coverage of like CNN and Fox. Sometimes they just especially in the beginning of the pandemic, it was just completely different messaging, right? And it was a crucial time. And again, it's because uh, they want uh, ratings. Uh, that's why media companies exist, to be popular, to make money. And those ratings coming from people watching what they produce. So I think it's, uh, it's one of the problems. Another problem is lack of education. As you rightfully pointed out, that uh, your background is a paramount for your education and your education is a, uh, is a essential function how you're going to process information how you're going to react to facts so lack of uh, good education well prevents a lot of people from making their own judgments and particularly uh, american uh, educational system where not everyone goes to college, and college is actually a privilege. This this gap is even wider, and then you put it in a context that actually the best education is in master's program, and even fewer, more privileged get that. That just uh, points a very stark difference between a human's perception and ability to critically acclaim information. And it just uh, underscores overall uh, trust issues that uh, people have with media and media messaging, right? But again, it's it's uh, people have all their lives to come up with certain values and certain beliefs, and I'm no one to disprove those beliefs. Only the personal experience will. Uh, help them or will not help them to change their mind. I'll give you an example. I recently saw a lady uh, in her mid 50s, uh, some extra weight other than that, no real comorbidities, uh, who's coming with uh, moderate to severe COVID to the hospital. Uh, she got better, unfortunately, after like uh, five, six days of aggressive therapy. And I was like saying, I'm about to discharge you, you're doing good, so you need to do this, this and that. You need to follow up with this doctor and that. 
and basically just watch out for these things. And if you have this, just, just basically discharge instructions. And she's saying, oh, thank you so much. You know that before this all happened to me, I did not believe in COVID. I mean, mm -hmm. I did not react. I mean, with masks, it's much easier because no one sees your facial expressions, which is good. But it, it is it is true. It's only a personal, individual experience can change someone's uh, belief system. I mean, unfortunately, you know, like uh, I've heard some person saying a very, very interesting thing. So those people who got COVID are outraged that quarantine measures and containment measures are so minimal and people who didn't get COVID or who don't love, who didn't lose a loved one to COVID or people who did not know someone who got COVID, they are saying that, hey, what are you doing? The COVID is fake, it's hoax news, it's a China virus and so on and so forth. And why even trying to limit my constitutional freedoms and why yeah. are you enforcing things on me? So you see uh, those two drastically at different point of views. Interesting. I wonder if, you know, I, I didn't really research it, but it, that's probably what I will do after this, because the uh, last pandemic was almost 100 years ago, Spanish flu, right? I wonder yeah. if that would happen 100 years ago if, you know, people also were polarized and, uh, you know, some people thought, oh, you know, this is too much, and some people thought who were affected that this is, you know, you are doing not enough. Uh, uh, if that would know, be the it, case it, as well. There is a, there is a stark example. Uh, you know that at that time, uh, United States of America were involved in the First World War. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there is this uh, example of a parade that happened in Philadelphia. Okay. Basically, it, it was a parade to raise awareness and raise money for the army. So it's uh -huh. basically uh, state was trying to get more funds to uh, finance the campaign. And it was done in the midst of pandemic. Like, and uh, within two weeks, two or three weeks, uh, extra 15 or 20,000 people died. In the, wow. it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's like, you can just simply Google uh, Philadelphia parade Spanish flu. And it's like articles, how hospitals were like overwhelmed, like people in the 20s, 30s were just choking to death and like, people couldn't do anything. And then there is example of like St. Louis, where they try to contain it and they try to limit all the spread and no mass gathering and they, uh, they got, uh, they were much better off. Uh -huh. And another thing, uh, during Spanish flu pandemic, uh, there, is a, there was a small island in, uh, uh, I think it was Pacific Ocean. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, the guy who was like a mayor or like in charge, he was a very big fan of radio and he was uh -huh. listening to all these cars, ones and everything. And basically, uh, once he heard of this, he started preparing and basically uh, then he heard that the neighboring islands got the first people sick and he said, hey, we can send you help. And they refused. And then they came to him and about uh, the ship uh, from that island tried to get to his island, asking to be docked and asking for help, and he refused. So basically, he quarantined an entire island uh -huh. for a year, wow. and no one, di no one died from Spanish. There was wow. a single place in the world that there were no Spanish for. Wow. Oh, uh, I'll f uh, we can Google it. I'll, I'll try to find out uh, the name of the island. Uh -huh. I just, it just got out of my mind. I, I, I can't remember it, but it's just this, I think it's a very, uh, very, very illustrative example, right? Yeah, it's uh, not, 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 not very basic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now we have like countries like Singapore, Taiwan, New Zealand, Australia. Well, there is no COVID. There is no yeah, community still spread. Still are doing a really good job, but uh, I heard they, they, they didn't they didn't do they have a totally different approach. They didn't do like cra crazy crazy quarantine. They basically tested everyone. Yeah, they can absolutely is, isolate the cases. Yeah, isolate the it, cases. It's basically a uh, test track isolate. That's uh, that's basically 
yeah, you may need a quarantine for some time, but that's you can safely open a society if, if you do the, all those things correctly. And I mean, I'll give you an example. Anyone traveling to Taiwan uh -huh. to is isolate uh, on arrival for 14 days. Oh, I mean, that's pretty reasonable. Yeah. yeah. In, in the States, don't you have this rule? Or do you? It's, uh, it's a, a guideline that is not enforced. Oh. So, <laughs> but yeah, basically, uh, you, technically you can do whatever you want. Okay, I see. Uh, well, I Canada, mean, you, 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 you do it, but uh, like, let's say my mother came from Norway uh, about a few months ago, a couple months ago. And she did quarantine everything fine, but only uh, at the 13th day of her quarantine, someone called her and they were like, hey, are you doing good? She was like, yes. So technically, they yeah. require you, but they don't enforce it as well. But again, uh, I, the, the problem is with the messaging, right? So we still don't know for how long you should quarantine, right? So the latest CDC guidelines saying that, hey, if you don't have symptoms, technically after 10 days, you're good. Or even more, well, if you contact someone, you can quarantine for seven days. And if you don't have any symptoms, you can test and, uh, and test is negative. You can uh, basically end your quarantine. So this idea of, of uh, like a messaging of a clear message that what should be done and what you should not do is just paramount. And unfortunately here, uh, United States, there is a widespread distrust in uh, a, a messaging by CDC, and especially uh, the initial messaging during the early days of pandemic undermined trust uh, in those in that organization. And on the other hand, there are examples of like South Korea, right, where there is a clear message what to do, and there is a, a clear uh, medical expert basically broadcasting this message on behalf of the government and everyone, no one is questioning it. And it's such mm -hmm. a high level of social trust to the government. And basically it's just, yeah, it's different, different reality. Well, yeah, I guess uh, it's uh, media here doesn't really uh, help this situation because people creating that polarized view and uh, it's uh, leading to the vaccine questions because because that particular messaging problem gonna you know affect how society reacts to vaccines and uh, like all the presidents right now ex presidents of states they're uh, they're um, announced that they going to be vaccinated publicly and if you look any Facebook uh, post you know there are basically two opinions one saying oh good job good job and another one saying that you know it's a fake vaccine again fake virus uh, let's try to figure out vaccines what do you know about them because there are a lot of them are they all the same are they all not the same can you buy i don't know only states one or or like is vaccine from other country good as well let's say if there is a short supply and you can buy you know and ship it here locally okay yeah so vaccines uh, so a couple of things vaccines are as good as data that support them and data comes from randomized clinical trials and the strength of those trials in the so in the shirts uh, i would much believe a vaccine that have a strong data to support it Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, and a strong and transparent data on efficacy and safety. And it, as we're seeing, we know for sure that, for example, China starting vaccinating its citizen and particular military in June and with more than one million people vaccinated right now. I, if you're going to ask me, hey, are you going to uh, recommend using uh, Chinese vaccine? It's Sinopharm and seen the back. It's uh, inactivated, inactivated vaccine. So basically it's a part of the virus. It's a virus that is being killed and basically cannot multiply, but has all the parts of the virus. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, 
con conventional method of developing a vaccine, uh, it uh, sounds okay, but since we don't have uh, any data from large scale trials, I'm no, in no position to recommend it, right? Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, since there is no, to test a vaccine, you need the spread of the disease. And since there is no spread of disease in China, they cannot do clinical trials of vaccine in China because there is just no cases to prevent. So they went to other countries, and in particular, United States, United Arab Emirates. And a couple of days ago, United Arab Emirates um, basically reported that uh, uh, the vaccine is 86% effective. Mm -hmm. But uh, from early reports, so there was like 31,000 patients. There were three arms in that trial. Which arms were compared between each other? So it's so unclear, and the exact details are unclear. So it, hopefully, the, once the publication will follow, we'll get. And I mean, another thing that kind of threw me off that it was announced just by the United Arab Emirates government, and the pharmaceutical company didn't partake anything in that message. So like, that doesn't really. It's like really, I kind of want you guys working together. Yeah, you, you kind of want to sell it, right? And the business yeah, so, let, mm, <laughs> so, and on the other hand, you see examples of Pfizer and BioNTech and Moderna, where they're very transparent with the protocols. It's a release the protocol, which is usually confidential information in advance. Uh, they presented preliminary data. And yesterday, I think it was, a uh, first of all, it's it's historical and it's mind blowing for anyone who just have uh, who working in medicine to see the speed of development of this vaccine. That uh, the genetic code of the vaccine was published on January 10. It's worth noting that the Chinese scientist who published the data was forced out of his lab. Wow. Yeah. Uh, well, he was reinstated later, but uh, I think he was out of job for some time. So it's. Uh, it just tells you so it's uh, and definitely now we are december 10 and we have data from at least three two more effective than others uh randomized clinical trials showing safety and yesterday there was a hearing of uh the independent review committee by fda that reviewed data in depth like in depth like in depth and depth and depth as they published all their materials that were discussing in a meeting online and it was broadcasted on YouTube, Twitter, and anyone actually who had any questions or concern could have uh, applied and uh, participated in that meeting asking questions. So I think it's a, a tremendous part to get people to understand that vaccine is safe. And I think that's, uh, uh, would be the second, uh, this, the next big challenge. Vaccine is here. Vaccine is amazing. Vaccine is pretty safe, like very safe. But the next thing would be to get to uh, make sure that people get this vaccine. Because if we have a, an amazing vaccine and only thirty percent of the population will take the vaccine, COVID will be with us forever. Right? It's it's that we need to vaccinate a decent amount of people, so we can do just a simple calculation. Uh, with the RT, so effective reproductive number. So basically how many people can one person with COVID infect, right? It's basically in completely unaffected population. It's about 2.5. Uh -huh. So based on that, we can calculate the number of people who needs to have immunity to spread the transmission to so-called herd immunity. So it's about 2.5. So it translates approximately to 70% of the population that we need to have an immunity. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. let's say, okay, 70% is the needed level of herd immunity. Now we have 85% effective vaccine. So let's say that not everyone will get two shots. Let's say that someone will get missed. Let's say we get 90%, right? Just for simplicity, uh, for simplicity of the uh, calculation. So basically we would need to vaccinate above 80% of the population with this highly effective vaccine to make sure that at least 70% of the population has immunity. Wow. So it's eight out of 10. It is, uh, if we're talking about a population of the United States, it's about 
300 millions, 300 millions, 80% of 300, 300 millions. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's around 250 millions who need to be vaccinated. Yep. And that's a, uh, and those people put aside logistical challenge, but those people would need to believe that they need to get it. And that's a problem that, uh, uh, I mean, probably you've heard news that some people in New York, uh, legislators, New York legislators trying to make it mandatory. I mean, I don't think it's the right public messaging to make something mandatory. I mean, you should just encourage people to understand why is it important and why is it good for them. Uh, but yeah, it's because uh, that news came after uh, a message that only 50% of uh, New York firefighters want to get vaccinated. Well, so yeah. coming back to coming back to your question, so. Uh, now we are in the era where messenger uh, RNA, so it's uh, basically part of the genetic. Uh, so you have DNA and reversed. So DNA being transcribed into RNA and RNA can be used for, by the cell to produce uh, proteins. So they tweaked, uh, they created uh, RNA that is similar to the spike of the virus and basically they inject um, billions of those instructions to create this protein that is later going to be expressed by the cell. And then that expression would activate the immune system. So essentially very neat, very uh, smart way of thinking about vaccines and essentially very, very effective and very few significant side effects. Of course, people would have pain in the side of the injection People would have fatigue, some people would have headaches, but overall, uh, interestingly, the rate of significant side effects were lower among people uh, older than 65 years of age. It's like by 10, 10, 15%. And overall, uh, the rate of significant side effects, those that require medical attention, were 0 0.5. So one in every 200 people who got a vaccine uh, needed this medical attention compared in placebo it was 0.6%. So completely the same number. So it, 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 uh, it just tells me that vaccine is safe. Uh, I know there was like a lot of, uh, things coming, uh, saying that, oh, it's sterilizing vaccine or something like that. Yeah. It, it's worth saying that, uh, I think 21. 21 or 23, I may be lying to you right now. It's 21 or 23 people uh, got pregnant during the study, even though the people were uh, told to use mm -hmm. contraception and not to get pregnant. And basically, I think it was like, if it's if it was 21, it was like 11 in the vaccine arm and 10 in the uh, placebo arm. So more people got pregnant in vaccine arm than in placebo. So it just tells you that uh, small numbers, but in general, I think it, it just unsubstantiated concerns and all those questions were actually uh, discussed during that panel. And I think there is a recording and I think if people would have time or desire to listen or to watch it, I think it would be very, very interesting. Okay, this is actually a lot of information that we got today. And I mean, it's been already 50 minutes, so let's probably keep it at, 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 at this time point. Sure. Yep. Okay. And we'll finish. And I'm going to be, I'll, I'll going to place the link to your uh, YouTube channel as well, so people can uh, go there and, and uh, watch. Uh, I guess. Thank you very much for your help here. And yeah, it's, it's really Thank good. You. Thank you. Thank you for your invitation. It's a pleasure being here and thank you to, to uh, share my perspective. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm going to stop the recording right now.